to a small pro program. But time can't be got back. So time is sort of the framework around which we have to deal with all of this from the ground up. We have to start with time. Now, that's why prioritization is important. What control do we have, especially if we can't really recruit, per se, if we're a youth coach or if we just sort of have to deal with what comes in the front door when we have open days? What control do we have over team speed? Remarkably little. There are programs for improving player speed. And if you start off with someone who's an absolute beginner, you can make really big leaps and bounds progress in their personal speed. If you get someone who's been playing the game and training to a reasonable standard for three, four, five years, you're only going to get fractional increases even if you go through the sort of whiz-bang, this is the way that the Olympic athletes increase their speed. You're only going to shave fractions off players like that. So your ability to control speed is limited, especially in the circumstances that we're in here in, in, in a club football environment. Maybe a high school coach in Texas has that much more control over speed, but on the other hand, he has also got players who've been playing the game since they were like this. So maybe he's only just shaving fractions off too. So speed, small control. Power, more control. Everyone can be made strong, one way or another. Starting with body weight exercises when they're young, working them intelligently through different kinds of lifting programs, always under careful supervision, always safe first, never daring with what you're trying to get your kids to lift or for that matter, your, your adults to lift. You know, always structured. You can make gains in power. People continue to grow along a power curve until about you know, a certain age in middle adulthood. And then that's it, even at the Olympic level, and they start to tail off. So there is more control over power. And if you're a youth coach, you can get your kids doing body weight exercises that won't hurt them, that will help build them up, that will help build core strength and then grow them from the core out in terms of being stronger players and therefore better football players. If you are a club coach, you have you know, inputs into, yes, I think you should go to the gym, yes, I think you should be doing these lifts, here's a program, see if we can adapt it to your needs, boom, boom, boom. And you're going to make significant gains in at least some of your players' strength. You have the ability to make significant gains in many of your players' strength, but it's still not total. Still don't have total control over power. Deception, you can do every play. If you have an offense that's based around what I referred to this morning as either A-type or M-type deception, uh, ambiguity, which is option offenses of various kinds, or M-type is misleading or misdirection, which is sort of series football, where you have a core play and then you have different um, Counters, basically, is the best word off of your core play, which attack different parts of the defense. So if your core play is going really well and they suddenly stop it by bringing the entire defensive backfield up and, and selling out to stop the run, well, obviously, one of your counters is going to be play action and, and throw the ball right over their heads. You attack wherever they adjust from. If they bring the defensive ends in to stop a power play, you attack that adjustment. You know, if they loosen their linebackers, you attack that adjustment. Whatever they do, you need a counter for. Anytime you have a core running play, you should have a play action pass that resembles that core running play. Because the more successful you are with that core running play, the more yards you're going to make easily. Because play action is like stealing candy from small children when it's done right. And you're losing great possibilities for cheap gains if you don't have play action pass that looks like every core running play. You shouldn't have more than two or at most three core running plays. You can run inside, if you can run off tackle, if you can run outside with authority. That's the most you want to have is three plays that you consider core plays. And each of those you build a series around. And each of them should at a minimum have a play action pass that looks just like it for the first second or so. There is an offense that I've discovered um, in old football books, which I used to haunt the library in San Francisco. Um, and I found just magic stuff from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And looking through some books from the late 1940s, I found something called the A Formation, which the then coach of the New York Giants had just come up with. He set his offensive line 
strong in one direction, and he said his back feels strong in the other. And it's a, it's a pistol-like formation in that the snap goes to someone who's only a few yards back from the center. It's not a deep shotgun snap. The center's basically just putting it back to about pistol depth for a player who's basically a, a quarterback. He's not under center, but this player, um, he or she, is taking the snap, um, handling <coughs> the ball, and passing. They're not expected to be a great runner, particularly, so it's not like the single wing where your best passer is usually also one of your best runners. This is more like uh, under center in that the division of labor is someone who's a ball handler and a thrower primarily, and then you've got specialized runners at other positions in the backfield. And so if you are an under center offense, you can try this as an easy adaptation that gives you a pistol look, which is still all the rage in a lot of places. Um, and its great advantage is that it has two qualities that I think are essential, especially at the younger levels of football and especially with women's football, which I hope will get to the point very soon in the UK where you have 11 person teams playing. I think it's a natural evolution and I think it's coming. Um, and I think this would be a perfect 11 person women's system, just as I think it's a perfect starting youth system at whatever age group you begin your players to play 11 on 11. We flop the one formation right and left. At, a mo at absolute maximum, there are 11 plays. And that's one running series and one sort of passing series. That's the absolute most you're going to need. And in many cases, I wouldn't say even more than eight plays were necessary for a full installation. OK, that's the formation. And as I mentioned, it's unbalanced in two different directions. Even though because this, the end is split out, it's not immediately obvious that it is unbalanced. If you brought him in tight, you'd see clearly that you've got a four-man surface on one side of the center. You've got strong guard, inside tackle, outside tackle, and then the end is out here. But this is still unbalanced because you've got both tackles on one side. That's not just nomenclature. You've got more offensive linemen on this side than on this side. The quick guard on the quick side, the strong guard on the strong side, um, tight end, wing back, blocking back, quarterback, and tailback. Depending on this person's foot speed, you can line them up anywhere between five and seven yards deep. And I'll get to sort of timing issues. And here I'm talking more or less about high school aged players or older. You need to adapt a lot of these, you know, you need to cut certain things down when you're talking about younger kids. But generally speaking, if you've got a really fast kid, you can put him back, her back, seven yards deep, if they're a little less speedy, but still a good inside runner, you move them up a bit, and then you give them a drop step on some of the plays so that they time things up to be more or less what it would be if they were lining up deeper. There are adaptations that can be made, but the whole thing is still really simple. The core play of this series involves, again, a pistol-style snap. This person's only three or four yards back goes here, they step diagonally toward the snap. If they're in this formation, with the tight end and the wing back to the left, then they're going to step, the center is, to, is one lineman over to their left, so they're going to step towards the center, take the snap as they're stepping, and then pivot and turn their back to the defense, and now the ball is hidden. And this is a key part of deception in almost every case. If you're doing M-type misdirection, misleading deception, you want to hide the ball right away. You want to make the ball disappear. You, you want a magician at quarterback, and he's going to make you know the rabbit come out of the hat, and then the hat's going to disappear. He spins. He half spins to be more accurate. He's got the snap. The wing back has come in motion, and is roughly behind the inside leg of the blocking back when the ball is snapped. Now, ball snapped. Pivot, and this person's coming right underneath, taking the handoff and heading outside on the speed sweep play. People call this jet sweep or fly sweep in other, in other offenses. I just call it a speed sweep in this case because that's really technically what it is. Motion, take the ball quickly from the quarterback and get outside. Following that, if this person is lined up shallow, they take a drop step and then fake inside. If they're lined up deeper, they don't bother with a drop step, they just attack downhill right now. And they want the defense to tackle them. Every time that they're faking inside, they want someone to tackle them. That's their criterion for success on the speed sweep play. When the wingback is sweeping, that tailback wants to be tackled. 
If they're not being tackled, they're not doing their job. They're not selling the inside fake sufficiently. So that's what you stress with them. You can make people fake even if they can't do anything else successfully. Anyone can be an all-American faker. It's one of the great sayings of the coach Mark Speckman. He was an astonishing man who was born without hands and yet played college football as a linebacker. He's one of the best motivational speakers I've ever even remotely heard of, and he's a hell of a football coach as well. He taught fly sweep at Willamette University in Oregon, and that's basically where I learned fly sweep from. And that's why I include the speed sweep in just about every offense I put together. This was, by the way, designed in 1938. This is the 1938 version of the fly sweep. So, pivot, sweep, fake, and now the quarterback will come down vertically to about where the tailback's heels were, and then they're going to boot away from the sweep. Because we want to attack the defense with the ball hidden on three fronts. We want the sweeper out here, we want the tailback inside, and we want the quarterback attacking this flank, and all of them, if they don't have the ball, are faking to the whistle. And again, if this person is faking, 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 the whole time they're keeping their eye on the end man on the line of scrimmage to the side of the bootleg. And when that person stops respecting the bootleg fake, guess what play we're going to call? Good call. As soon as they neglect their duties, which includes check boot. You know, you look in the, the, the Bible of, of defensive ends, and it will say, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, the heavens and the earth were created in the defensive end check boot. And when they stop checking boot, you boot. And that, again, is this theory of a core play, which is, we think the sweep, but hold on, there's a little bit of, of misdirection coming up even in the series design. We want the defense to think the core play is the sweep. And it's not, actually. But we'll get to that in a second. But we're misdirecting. And so, if they're following sweep, following sweep, we're booting away, we're booting away, and when they stop respecting that fake, we'll call the real thing and we'll sting them very badly. We'll hurt them for a lot of yards or, or even some points without any extra effort on our part. Now I'm going to show you, and hopefully this will actually work, a video of an Indian reservation school in New Mexico, the Babo Kivari Indian School football team. This was run in 2004, and this is a film clip of the very first time that they ran the speed sweep from A formation in a game. And it ain't pretty, but you'll see what the result is. Let's cross our fingers that it actually works. Okay, 10 yards. Even though that was the worst blocked play I've ever seen in my life, I've seen some bad blocking. There are two or three basic points for making the sweep successful. They blew all of them. And the kids still made 10 yards. If they had achieved the one crucial block on the line of scrimmage that is absolutely necessary for this play to succeed, it would have gone for 15 or more yards. And this is, a, you know, this is supposed to just be a steady ground game. But it has the potential to bust plays like that even when everyone, or just about everyone, blows it. Now, I want you to watch the outside tackle, who should be hooking the end man on the line of scrimmage to the inside. They should reach that MLOS defender, as we call them, just get their head around them, just stay outside of them, stay outside of them. You may end up with something that doesn't look more effective than a basketball screen. You know, there's no, you know, sort of massive collision necessary. Just tie them up. Keep them from pursuing successfully for one, two, two and a half seconds and you've got a football play. That doesn't happen, and let's watch this again. He blocks him exactly the wrong way. Did about as bad a job as I can imagine an outside tackle doing. Actually blocked that MLS defender outwards. And again, this is the first time they were running it, so I'm cutting them some slack here. But if he, and we'll watch it one more time, if you can see in your mind's eye, what would have happened if you'd hooked that defender in and had a bigger gap right when the back was hitting the line of scrimmage? 
if you hook that guy in, there's a pathway. He wouldn't have to belly back, he wouldn't have to lose time, and he would have made a lot more than the 10 yards that he made. And this is the first time they ever ran it and they made 10 yards. They were convinced at this point that this stuff actually worked. I'm actually going to back up one slide. Back here, one of the characteristics of the speed sweep is this block, which is, again, supposed to be here on this side, you know, blocking in instead of pushing him out, which is sort of what he did. And he came here, and this, the, the wing back had the belly and, and lost potential yardage there. There's a number of ways you can block this. In this version, I'm having the split end threaten the force player and then crack to the inside. Bringing the inside tackle out and having him kick out the force player. And if he's successful, you cut it up inside. If he fails, you can, you know, if, if the guy fights to the inside, then you can just run around him. But either way, you have a good potential there on the corner. Everyone else on the line of scrimmage in the blocking back releases immediately for the second and third level. You don't block any defensive lineman to the inside of this guy. You don't block him. You don't block him. You don't block him, and you most certainly don't block him because he's checking boot, or should be. Now what does this do? This gives us a wall of big bodies to slow down, at least, the assembly line of linebackers, and to prevent the safety from coming up and making a spectacular hit. We've got that track block working to the inside. We've got the blocking back sort of sweeping through here and cleaning up any junk that gets through. And we've got a picket line of bodies to slow down pursuit from the second and third level. Meaning, if he does get past this point, past the danger area, there's going to be a whole lot of green grass in front of that wing back. And he or she ought to be able to exploit that on a regular basis. So that's really simple. And the reason we can afford to block so few people is because it's a really fast hitting play. Because even if you let this person through untouched, because this is backed off in the line of scrimmage and they're moving fast, you can prove this to your team in drills. You can let a three technique come through untouched and they won't be able to make the tackle on the speed sweep. In fact, you need to do that to demonstrate to your offensive lineman why they're not blocking anyone on the, off on the first level to the back of this guy. Because they're not going to make the tackle. And so this becomes an important part of the design. It lets you get to the second and third levels immediately. It simplifies your task. And if you pop past this guy, you're gone. So again, this looks really good. It looks like a great core play. But wait, there's more. The real core play. <coughs> Ooh, damn. All right, this hurts. The tailback power play is an A-gap power play. And one of the best plays in football because it potentially hits straight ahead, as far as I'm concerned, with speed, with power, and with deception. The blocking is about as simple as you can get. It's something called severe angle blocking. These linemen are blocking at a 30 degree angle to the line of scrimmage. If zero degrees is here, then they're blocking at 30. And they just come right down on the track, 30, 30, 30, 30, which gives them a huge mechanical advantage. And we can prove this for you using vectors. We can prove it using algebra. There's different ways to show that the force generated on someone who's moving this way by someone who's moving this way is greater than it would be if they were just hitting head on. So you can make your linemen bigger and stronger by having them angle block. This is an effective use of mechanical advantage in play design. So everyone from the center to the outside tackle is blocking at a severe angle. And we're going to take whatever we can get. If there's a body there, we're going to knock the heck out of it. If there isn't, we're going to go through to the next level. We're going to cut off pursuit. The blocking back is going to kick out a nice sort of banana root inside out. And when this person comes forward, they're going to get kicked out. The quick guard is going to pull through for whoever is trying to attack downhill. And the thing about this kind of blocking is that when people see a blocking back here and they see a pull here, they're thinking C-gap power play. They're going to think off-tackle power. And they're going to think, we know how to stop this. 
you know, we have fits that will allow us to attack the CGAP power play. There's a problem here for them. This is a run to daylight play, and it really means that it's a run to daylight play. This can hit anywhere from here to here with equal facility, depending entirely on what the tailback sees in front of him or her. If there's green grass of any sort, if there's a gap in between defensive bodies, whether they've been blocked or not, or whether they've just taken off to the sideline because they think it's a sweet play, because they think that's the core play of this series, we don't care. If it's grass, it's grass, and we're running to it. We go where the grass is greenest. So there is no design point of attack apart from here to here, and that's a big hole. And we're facilitating that not only by angle blocking the heck out of their best and strongest players. We're leading, we're kicking out, we're gap sound in here. No one can do something sneaky on us because we've accounted for every gap in this section of the defense. We're hinge blocking here, which is like you do on the back side of a sprint out pass. This person checks inside first. If someone tries to shoot that gap, they take them down. If no one shows, they drop step, and they make whoever's coming this way go the long way around. So there's a wall of protection here for this back. After the wing back has come through, we've got the fake, and the quarterback's hidden the ball by turning away from the defense. So the ball's invisible. So the wing back fake is entirely credible. And of course, even when you block it badly, you make 10 yards, so they've got to respect that threat. So you're going to have two or three defenders that are going to be thinking sweep, sweep, sweep as soon as they see that motion. As soon as they see the quarterback do this, the blocking back comes over this way, that could be sweep. Okay, so this looks like sweep until this time the tailback gets right up inside wherever he or she sees green grass. Daylight. Run to daylight, Vince Lombardi said. This was what he was talking about. And we're going to design this into every single tailback power play that we run. Okay? This is the core play of the series. It looks like the wingback sweep is because it's the flashy one. This is the real core play. This is the killer. You can run this play 20 or 30 times a game. It's a perfectly gap sound power play that also has the best misdirection in football built in because the wing back is threatening the sweep, because the quarterback is threatening the boot. This guy, this guy can't afford to ignore the quarterback. That's two defenders gone. Five or six people are going to be out here thinking sweep. Okay? So that's seven or eight defenders gone. So you have three defenders in here. We're going to stop that tailback on a regular basis. I think not. And this is all done by fitting things together the right way. Because you've got an outside threat here, because you've got an outside threat there, the threat up the middle, which you can intelligently design a blocking scheme into, which cannot fail. As long as these kids know what a 30 degree gap looks like, a 30 degree angle looks like, and you put the little blocking boards at a 30 degree angle, and you have them run that track in practice until they've done it a thousand times. And then they get really good. They say, but what if there's no one there? And you say, keep running. Well, what happens when we get to the sideline, coach? Order a soft drink. <laughs> Worry about that when it happens, but block that angle. No one is coming through. No one is going to blow this play up. Defenses love to talk about blowing up power plays. This is unblowable because they think it's coming here because that read tells him to step down. He's, someone's trying to kick him out. Oh, God, it's a power play. You know, he knows how to stop this. He knows how to really, really mess this play up. And then he sees the tailback running by him two holes over, untouched. That's a heartbreaker. He's done his job perfectly. He's fought, you know, he's blocked down, stepped down. He's fought off the kick out block. He's in perfect position, and the ball's gone up the middle. He, you know, the guy's already 10, 15 yards downfield by the time the defensive end looks around. This is psychologically crushing beyond physical effect. When you mess with people this way, when you give them these variations without mercy, it, it makes them crumple. I've seen this before so many times. It really does make a difference. Okay, I'm going to really not go through much of the rest of this offense. I'll tell you where to find it. Bootleg is the third play in that main series. Here we send the blocking back out to the flat on the quick side. We send the tight end out on a quick corner out, so we're going to high-low whoever's left out there uh, as a pass defender. 
after the sweep threat, after the power play threat, which is still in operation, both of which they have to respect. Whichever one or two bodies on the defense are actually out there at that point, you know, throw deep, throw short, or run the ball. It's a triple threat play. Without too many live bodies on defense, they're to stop it. And why does it work so well? Because of the sweep threat, because of the power threat. Because they all interlock, because they look like the same play until they're not. There's a counterplay for those occasions when having your tailback be able to run from here to here are not enough. We're going to use the old Washington Redskins counter tray, only we're going to counter gap block it because we like that severe angle 30 degree block. And we're going to come back hard against the flow. And it works great. It works better than when the Redskins did it because when they had John Riggins doing counter tray, the counter action was this. That was it. And then he ran this way. That was the counter. Put your hand up if you missed it. That's not much of a counter. It's a power play. The way the skins used to run it, it's a power play. They call it a counter gap or a counter tray, but it's a power play. Well, this is a power play too. This is gap sound. You can attack people all day long with this. But there's a real element of misdirection here. Wing back's still going in motion. We're still threatening the sweep. Okay? So now, severe angle, severe angle, severe angle. Strong guard is kicking out. The inside tackle is leading above the hole. The outside tackle is hinge blocking, just like the tight end did on the speed sweep. So we're going to cut off anyone trying to charge through that gap. We're going to take them right down. Anyone who comes up a long way, they're going to have to go all the way around. They'll never catch up. Tailback here, quarterback fakes, pivots, fakes to the wing back on the sweep. Gives to the tailback, doesn't really worry about a boot so much here. Gains depth to get out of the way. But here, the tailback on his or her third or fourth step is going to cut back hard. He's going to follow the inside tackle into the hole. That's a lead blocker. That's a personal protector for the tailback on this play. Cut inside, cut outside off that block. It's brilliant. It's a gap sound power play, very effective in its own right. Marry it with the speed sweep motion, and you're going to drive people on the defense crazy for no extra effort, other than the fact that you've built it into a series of plays that facilitate misdirection. Play action. Again, if you've got a core play, you need play action. And again, we know that the core play is actually the tailback power, but we're still going to run the wing back on the fake. The quarterback's going to fake, the tailback is going to help block, and then the quarterback this time is going to roll to the strong side of the formation to facilitate a go route by the split end, a shallowish cross by the tight end. This is Y cross, really. This is a old Norm Chow play from BYU. And the wingback's sweep route is now going to become sort of a, a swing route out into the wide flat area. And now you've got a triangular distribution of receivers. You've got a quarterback who's got the ball and is way the heck left containment behind, so you've got the option to run as well. So you've got four threats on very few defenders. Okay? So that's that series. I'm not even going to really go into the passing game on the A formation. Um, there are some very nice pass through packages. I've included a screen in the draw because this is intended to be a full implementation. You don't even need that much, quite frankly. If you run nothing but the speed sweep series along with play action, you can make an offense out of that. <laughs> I like to have some sort of semi-sprint passes, a drop back or two. I, I like having a screen. I like having a draw. These are not essentials. So let's go from there to the other offense I'd like to talk to you about. And that is the Wild Bunch. And this is something that I came up with myself because I fell in love with Coach Mark Speckman's fly sweep at Willamette University in Oregon. And I just, I liked everything about it except that he was running it from a two back formation. And I was married at that point the idea of a one-back formation to 
to be able to throw a bunch passing, you know, to a, a cluster of three receivers on one side, and to be able to throw run and shoot passes to a spread out bunch of receivers on the other side, just using motion. And because we were sending people in flat motion along the line of scrimmage, I started thinking, well, what run game fits in with that? Well, you saw that speed sweep in the A formation. Well, the fly sweep from an under center formation looks even more like run and shoot motion or bunch attack motion. In fact, they're identical. So let's have a look at that. Okay, the motion itself becomes misdirection because we want the defense to be impeded in its recognition for as long as humanly possible. We don't want the defense to catch on to what's going on until the last possible moment. So we're going to send people across the formation in motion on just about every play. But what does that portend is the question that the defense has to answer. Is it a pass? Is it a run? Is it a drop back pass that turns into a draw? Is it play action that turns into a pass? You know, we can do all of these things off the same basic motion and from one, really one formation with a few minor variations to it. There's a few core plays. There's the speed sweep in both directions. That's the core running play in this offense. And then there's three different passing series, one of which is drop back passing, one of which is run and shoot passing, and one of which is bunch attack passing, which again is putting three receivers into a, a tight little triangle when the ball is snapped and really screwing around with the defense's ability to um, get leverage on pass receivers. They can't play man defense against um, a, a bunch if it's executed properly, and it's really hard to zone it as well. And the idea, again, is we establish the core, they adjust, we attack the adjustments. It's the same philosophy on a little more sophisticated level. Um, if you go to scribed.com slash tedc, T-E-D-S-E-A-Y, um, you'll see all my stuff. And I recommend that you go there and have a look at the different materials I've done over the years. It's all on there for free. Um, I'm selling the book on the Wild Bunch, and I'll talk about that, but there's more to the book than I have made available on the internet about the Wild Bunch, and I've had the Wild Bunch on the internet since 1998. So it's been out there for a while in different versions, but I believe enough in what I've done with the book to be selling a product for the first time since I've been involved with, with football coaching and, and with sharing on the internet, which is basically what I've done up until the point that I wrote the book. But there's enough more in there for me to justify having it for sale. Okay, this is going to look familiar. This is the fly sweep series with the slot back, you might call H, going in motion <coughs> and threatening the fly sweep. This is split end who's really split out wide. I want to create the maximum stretch on the defense. I want to force them to adjust and widen out. But then that's the spread side of the formation, and this is the bunch side. I don't want to spread the defense out on this side of the formation. I want to be able to compress the defense on this side of the formation by motioning H across to here and having a bunch of three receivers when the ball is snapped and making the defense respect that. I want to make them commit more than three defenders to my three receivers because then I win the numbers game someplace else. And you can't really successfully defend a bunch attack with just three defenders. So I'm forcing an over adjustment by the defense just by bunching my receivers and then making that threat credible by having some success throwing to them. You know, you can have a threat in theory that's not worth much because you can't get the football out there. That's no threat. But if I can establish the bunch and if I can make some yards doing that, then I'm causing real pain for the defense and forcing them to over adjust. And again, the, the, the philosophy here is you run the core stuff, and in this case, it's a core bunch attack pass. Make the defense adjust and then attack the adjustment. I mean, it, play calling cannot be easier than this. You have someone who's looking to see what the defense is doing to adjust to your core plays. You know, your core play is going for 9, 10, 15, 20 yards a pop. They're not adjusting. Never mind. It's going to be a good day no matter how you look at it. They start slowing your core play down for 7, 6, 5, 4, 3 yards. They're adjusting somehow. You have someone looking to see what the adjustments are, and then you attack the adjustments. This is not, as they say, rocket surgery. Now this is the part of the fly sweep series that goes this way with H in motion. When the Z receiver over here, this is Y the tight end, even though he's flexed out. This is Y, this is Z. 
when z goes in motion that way, then there's a fly sweep series to that side as well. So this is this is the bunch side fly attack, if you will. Um, the place consists of, not unnaturally, the fly sweep, which is out wide. That's the green light sweep, in which um, H, the sweeper, has the green light to run wide. We want him or her to take the hash marks and numbers in the sideline. They just they're gonna go wide, 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 and then downfield. There's a red light version of the sweep as well, which we're gonna cut up in the C gap or just a little bit wider than that if necessary. There's a dive play by the fullback, which we're gonna fake every single time we run the sweep <coughs> until we notice that no one's tackling the fullback when he or she comes through on their fake. And when they stop tackling the fullback, guess who's getting the, full, the football? It, it calls itself. The fullback comes back to the sideline after a series and says, coach, they're not tackling me on sweep anymore. Here it comes. Well, they gotta get ready for that. Beyond that, there's two more plays in this series, and one of them is the quarterback pivoting from under center, faking for a second, really, the fly sweep handoff to H, but keeping the ball in tight where it's safe. The quarterback never does the faking. We never do this when the quarterback has the ball. If the quarterback's pivoting to facilitate a fake, it's H who's doing the fake. H is coming over with the arm and ducking the shoulder away and making it look like he or she has the football. The quarterback is protecting the ball. That's always job one. The quarterback pivots on this play, which is an inside counter trap. H takes off, F takes off, and the quarterback continues a full spin and heads up inside, and there's a trap block coming back this way. And if they've been seeing nothing but Sweep, dive, sweep, dive, sweep, dive over this way. This is going to open a real gaping big hole in the middle of the defense. And finally, we've got the quarterback boot. And again, we know when to call that as well because the quarterback is checking boot every time that we run sweep or dive this way. They're looking, 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 looking at that defender. If it's a backer who's down here as the end person on the line of scrimmage, they're looking, looking, looking. They eyeball that defender when they fake the boot. They keep eye lock on that defender when they're faking the bootleg, when they've got a hand back here as though they might have the football. If they don't have the attention of that defender, we're going to run boot real quick. And as you can see, there's a sweep play. Again, we're only blocking the end person on the line of scrimmage. We're releasing everyone else. The fullback should get tackled. They're faking the dive play. If they're not getting tackled, we're calling the dive play real quick. There's different ways to block on the edge. One of the best is to release for a deep pass, especially in a passing down situation. Because you can make, if, if you're in third and seven, run the fly sweep. Release X and Y downfield on, on fade routes. Send them deep. You'll make your seven yards. There won't be a defensive back anywhere near that sweeper when they come past the, the first down marker. Okay, red light sweep, a different change up. We, we tighten formation a little bit when we're going to call this. And here we're kicking out the end person on the line of scrimmage. We're blocking strong to the inside. And the sweeper takes the ball and then stops and changes direction and cuts vertically downfield. And yes, they can do that if they know where they're supposed to cut. And as an experiment, think about a school corridor with a bunch of doors. And you tell your kid to run down that corridor. And you're going to tell them which door to, to cut into. If they don't know, know which door to cut into, they can't do it. They can't do it neatly and cleanly. If they know that it's room 22, even if room 22 is 15 yards away, they're going to be able to cut on a dime. Because they're going to anticipate room 22 coming up, and they're going to make that cut nice and clean. So as long as they know that that's the spot where they're going vertical, it works. It takes very little effort to coach the red light sweep as an adjustment. And we do that, of course, when this person who's sick and tired of getting hooked to the inside, starts making a violent move upfield into the outside at the snap. So we're going to kick him out and run inside him. That play calls itself when that adjustment starts to show up by the end line, the defender on the end of the line. But I play. When do we call it? When they stop tackling the fullback on the sweep. When they stop respecting the dive fake, we call the dive play. The spin trap, which is a favorite of mine, um, angle block, angle block, angle block. We get 
the mechanical advantage for our offensive linemen whenever humanly possible. We make their job easier. We don't ask them to butt block someone who's bigger than they are. We get their neighbor to block down on that big person. We double them if we have to. We absolutely can't move a body that's too big. But one way or another, we're going to find a way to shift that defender. We trap back against the flow. This linebacker's gone. That linebacker's checking cut back and or gone. That defensive back is gone. This one's probably heading for the deep middle. So if this quarterback can pop through here, they've probably got a lot of daylight in front of them. Now that isn't an every time, you know, that's not a, a 10 times a game play. Even if you've got a good running quarterback, I wouldn't <coughs> necessarily risk a fly sweep quarterback on that play that often. But it's good to have in the arsenal if you've got a Tim Tebow at quarterback. Bootleg, same again. Every single time, a sweep play or a dive play, the quarterback is faking boot, they're, they're looking at that defender who should be checking them. When they stop checking them, we run the boot. Okay, now, there is also a fly sweep series with Z in motion. It's longer motion, it attracts more attention from the defense because it's longer motion, it takes longer to develop. And we like that. We want the defense's attention. We want to get their expectations building in certain ways. And then we want to exploit those expectations. Now here, clearly the expectation is to fly sweep. Because if they're motioning all the way over here, H only motions about that far when H is running fly sweep toward the bunch side. When C is running fly sweep toward the spread side, that's longer motion. That's going to make more of an impression. We like this. We can do even more things to misdirect when we've got Z's motion, which is longer. OK. Easy peasy. First play in the series is Z out wide on the fly sweep, the green light sweep. Second play is red light sweep, where Z cuts it up, because this defender is getting ideas about stopping the fly sweep, and they're flying out here when the ball is snapped. Great. We'll call red light and run inside of them. Third play in the series is the dive to the fullback. They stop honoring the fake of the dive, we run the dive. Fourth play is the same counter trade <coughs> or gap play that we saw in the A formation. It's the same old red skin stuff, yet again. And here's John Riggins taking that step. Like, that's misdirection. Thank you, Mr. Riggins. Except this time it is misdirection. Because this time we've got the best fake in football, which is long, 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 long motion. Boom, we're taking the fly sweep out there. They have to respect that. And when the fullback takes one step in that same direction, for at least one linebacker out there, that is presumptive evidence of guilt. Your Honor, the play is a fly sweep. Except it's not. Because now we're coming back up inside, and we're kicking out, and we're leading. Um, actually, in this case, we lead through the hole with H, and we hinge block with the uh, spread side offensive tackle. It's a slight variation on the blocking pattern, but it works very effectively. And what matters most is that there won't be anyone here by the time we call this. Because we don't call it until people are vacating this area of the defense. And we've got eyes in the sky one way or another. We've got a, you know, a parent up on a hill someplace, or if we're lucky, we've got a, you know, a ladder or something, and we've got someone observing what's going on. They say, whoa, you know, there's no one home when we run fly sweep to the spread side, coach, you ought to think about calling the counter to the fullback. Okay. But that's not all. That's not the only misdirection in this version of the series. But wait, there's more. There's also a play called the truck counter sweep, which is a gap sound sweep play, a la Vince Lombardi and Green Bay Packers in 1962. You can run it a million times a game, it works perfectly well on its own, but again, in this case, because of how we fit it in with the other interlocking parts, we've married it to the best play fake in football. We are motioning Z in along here. If they don't hustle, he's going to make 7, 8, 9, 12 yards on them, on this fly sweep. And once they respect that, then when we send her in motion, her teammate is going to come back through the fullback's foot, you know, footprints, basically, the starting position of where the fullback lined up, get, a, get the ball from a dropping quarterback, and we've got a sweep play out here with one or two guards pulling ahead of her. We have got a fantastic misdirection play 
which is also a perfectly sound power sweep. So we're faking out wide here, and we're going out wide here with lead blockers out front. If there is anyone who's smart enough to notice that this is not in fact a fly sweep out that way, we're going to run them over. And finally, there's play action. So I'm showing the quarterback dropping deep for play action as the sixth variation on that version of the fly sweep series. You notice there's no fat here. Every single play, both with H in motion to the bunch side and Z in motion to the spread side, serves a purpose. There's five plays to one side, there's six plays to the other, all 11 of them are essential for attacking one defensive adjustment or another to the core fly sweep. And I'm not going to spend time, again, on the details of these. It's counter gap, counter tray. Again, we gap block. If we get that mechanical advantage, we clean bodies out, we trap with a guard, we hinge with a tackle, and we lead the H-back through the hole to block whoever's coming down vertically. Truck counter sweep. This is one hell of a sweet play. I love this thing. Quarterback pivots. Z is doing the faking. The quarterback never does the ball faking in this offense. We don't want people dribbling the football thing very much. Quarterback keeps the ball in tight as he or she pivots. Their back is turned to the defense. The ball is gone. It's disappeared. Here's the magician here dealing the cards. And the defense won't know what it is until it's too late. Z continues. But now H at the snap drop steps right back through where the fullback's feet were. Quarterback having pivoted now drops vertically, which they do anyway on their boot fake. Hands the ball to H, coming back the other way. The quick side guard, the spread side guard, always pulls. If the bunch side guard is uncovered, if there's no lineman here, <coughs> the bunch side guard will also pull. And then we've got a fantastic play with two leading guards. And no one over here anyway, because they're all stopping Z's fly sweep. It never comes. This play, it's like counter gap if you've got a great fullback for running inside, you run that play to death after you establish the fly sweep to Z. If you've got a really quick back at H, not only can you run him or her on the fly sweep this way, you can also give them the ball on the truck counter sweep 5, 10, 15 times a game. And you know it's up to the defense to stop all of these threats. And the way they fit together, we make it darn near impossible for them to shut any one thing down without suffering grievous bodily harm from the rest of the series. Now there's also a passing component. Um, the 50 series, drop back passing, is the only part of the offense that starts without motion. And that in itself becomes misdirection. Because if you've got a snap count where you have to wait for H or Z to get into position before you snap the ball, that's going to have a certain rhythm to it. And the defense is going to start to notice that rhythm, which actually facilitates misdirection within those series. If H is in motion for a certain amount of time, then they're expecting a sweep, or if H goes in motion across the formation to form the bunch, then they're expecting a bunch pass, and then we can exploit those expectations as well. But, having said that, we have an entire series where no one's in motion. Come up under center, everyone set, bam, snap the ball. Right now. Make sure the defense is awake. Because after a certain point, they're going to start anticipating motion. So I'm not going to throw a 50 series pass on the first play of the game. I'm going to wait. I'm going to throw a 60 or a 70 series pass with motion first play in the game, maybe. Or a play action pass based off of one of our core plays, maybe. But I'm not going to throw this stuff until a little bit further into the game, when they're in a rhythm of, OK, either that dude's motioning or that dude's motioning. They snap the ball. No one's in motion. We're hosed. It gives you a step. And a step can be crucial in this game. Um, um, blah, 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 four verticals. The only innovation here is the way that I've tagged the vertical game so that any of the four receivers, X, H, Y, or Z, can be tagged with a dig root, which looks like it's going into a post and then it cuts flat and, and horizontal across the field, or a shallow cross. And you can do X over H, you can do H under X, you can do literally, you know, I forget how many combinations it is, but it's a lot of 
any one of these four receivers either over or under another receiver. And all over or under means is, this is 50 cm is the play call, which is four verticals. And anyone who's not tagged is going to run their vertical route. So there's no new learning for them. They hear 50 seam on the offensive line, they're blocking drop back passing. As it turns out, we have slide for tech, and I can discuss that if there's time and anyone interested. Um, the fullback happens to know what to do on 50 seam. They don't care about the tag either. The only people that care are X, H, Y, and Z. If they are tagged, Y over H. Y over H, Y has the dig, H has the shallow cross. If it's H under Y, Y has the dig, and H has the shallow cross, but rather than prioritizing Y over H, rather than going 1, 2, if it's H under Y, the quarterback will go 1, 2. So any combination of any two of these receivers is possible. One of them gets the dig, the first one gets the dig, the second one gets the shallow cross. And you can make it look anything from like, Dig here, shallow cross here, which has a certain threat on the underneath defenders on this side of the formation. You can dig here, shallow cross here, you can dig here, you can do any combination you want. And then above and beyond that, you can tell the quarterback high then low, or you can tell the quarterback low then high. And all of this affects exactly five people, um, exactly three people actually, the two tag receivers and the quarterback. They're the only people that aren't running 50 seam. They're running a variation of 50 seam. They may still throw, the quarterback may still throw the verticals. They may still throw the fade on this. If that's what's open, we're not telling them, you know, you can't throw to the out, you know, on this one you've got both outside receivers fading. They're not off limits. We may still end up with a, a forward vertical style pass. It's just that we're showing the defense a completely different look. An entire series of completely different looks with a letter, a word, and a letter. And again, the variations, I, I had the number in my head of how many possible combinations there are of the four receivers over and under each other. And it's a big one. And it, it's no additional cost in teaching. This, this is a five minute adjustment. You, the light bulb will go on after about two minutes with your receivers. Quarterbacks usually take a little longer. But they get it eventually, you know, somewhere in that five minute period all the light bulbs will be on and you've got yourself a new passing game built into your four verticals package. You can attack defenses all day long with this one play. No matter what their coverage scheme. Man, zone, combo, we don't care. We're going to find where you're not good at covering the pass and we're going to attack it. Because we can over under you with any of those four receivers and tell the quarterback go high, go low, and we will find your weak point with this one pass. That's the first pass play we've talked about, apart from play action, in this whole offense. And look, we can go anywhere. By design, by packaging the things together intelligently, we can do a hell of a lot with the four verticals. Then there's Smash. This is, this is like stealing candy from babies, only worse. Smash is a classic cover two attacker. Z is stopping down low, hitching or else moving inside or outside against man coverage, depending on leverage, depending on where the defender isn't. Getting open, basically, but staying low. Not dropping back, not gaining depth. Keeping the defender down low, ideally. H is up and outside. We've got a flag route, a corner route, whatever you want to call it. So we're going to high-low that corner two cover, uh, cor that cover two cornerback and make their life miserable just by doing this. But wait, there's more. Now we've got an outside release and a vertical stem and a dig root by the tight end, by Y, the flexed out tight end here, the semi bunch. We've got an inside release, a switched release as it were, and then a vertical root by Z. If the middle of the field is closed, which is to say, if there is a single safety in the middle of the field, then Z will cut their root up outside of them, down the seam, to the outside, just you know, either forcing that safety over or else more likely outrunning them. If there is no deep middle safety, if we're playing against cover two or some other variation of, of middle of the field open, cover four, then they're going to cut right into the hole. They're going to turn it into a post route. 
So depending on who's there, after, and we don't do the root adjustment based on what they line up with before the snap. We do it on the fly. So by the time they're here, this is a decision point for Z and the quarterback. If they're looking, if the quarterback has decided that this is the side of the formation to attack, they're waiting to see if Z is going down the seam or to the post. And they'll throw accordingly. And the defense will be wrong no matter what they do. And all of this, again, built into one pass play. This is a coverage beater that works against just about everything. And yet it's supposed to be just a little, you know, cover two thorn. The, the smash route is, is classic how to attack cover two, low corner, high safety. And we built the backside package into it in a way that we can attack absolutely anything. We've got a screen out here to X, which is a great little quick screen. X comes back down and runs toward the quarterback at the snap, gets the sort of half to three quarter pace pass from the quarterback. If you gun this, it'll go right through Z, X's hands. They're running toward the quarterback. You do not put full velocity on the ball. As soon as they get the ball, they cut down field. They've got H blocking. They've got the spread side guard blocking. They've got the center blocking. You know, you, you cut people off, basically, from pursuit. And then what are we doing on the bunch side? We're showing four verticals again. And you know the fullback blocking the deep set by the visible lineman here is uncovered. This is the person that defensive backs are looking at to see if it's run or pass. He's showing pass. He's showing pass. He's showing pass. He's showing pass. Okay, it's pass, no problem. And then we're going to throw the screen <coughs> over here to take advantage of teams that are a little too enthusiastic about pass routes, about defensive backs retreating, and actually about. Off uh, defensive linemen coming upfield as hard as they can. You notice the deep set by the spread side tackle. He's drawing this guy upfield as fast and as hard as he can. You get him past the throwing lane. The quarterback actually waits till he's gone past before he throws this ball. And it works like a charm. I've never seen that defensive end intercept an alley screen. Okay, draw play. Now we get to the run and shoot series, and notice what we have. We have Z in motion. Now it's longer motion. He's in motion now until he's over on the spread side. And that supposedly should tell the defense all it needs to know. Shorter motion by Z, it's, a, it's the fly sweep series. Longer motion by Z, it's the run and shoot series. Maybe. Go is one of the great passing packages in all of football. You create run and shoot trips to the spread side of the formation. Um, you semi-roll the quarterback toward that side. You block strong to that side. It's more or less sprint pass blocking. There's reach blocking by the three linemen. The fullback blocks the end man on the line of scrimmage. And you hinge the two backside linemen. So you've got good solid protection in that area for your quarterback, um, who is looking basically, having driven off defenders with two deep receivers, to throw to, to H on a like one yard or two yard shoot route. Just a, a quick route out there into the flat. You can, that's a ball control pass you can throw all day long. If they don't handle that correctly, then you've got a home run shot built in. There's a short route, which is another way of attacking cover two, which I particularly like. It involves a quick inside slash by Z. It involves a quick post by the motion man. I'm sorry, X has the short route. Um, the motioning Z has the quick post. H has a, a go route just to clear out as many people as he or she can. And basically, you're isolating the underneath defender um, on the spread side. They either have to respect the quick post and go with it, or they have to cover the short and go with it. And either way, you've got a wide open receiver. And it's a very quick play. Now, what else can we do from long Z motion in a run and shoot pass play? I'll tell you what we can do. We can run the fullback right up the middle. We can trap the heck out of this. And you can trap it either way, depending on where the one technique and the three technique are. And you always want to trap the three technique. You don't want to get into a situation where you're trying to trap block someone who's just off your center's nose. So we will down block that person. We will down block into the second level. And we will trap here. And the fullback's just going straight ahead. And you know the next time they're seeing, they'll be running up the stadium steps and still have the football. Um, because if you do this at the right moment, when you've been running go and running go and running go, there won't be anyone there. Um, these guys get a little too enthusiastic about pass rushing, 
and they lose discipline, which everyone does eventually, especially when they get tired, and you run the trap. And you make 20 yards on the ground when they're expecting a run and shoot pass, which again is a bit soul breaking, which is part of this offense. You're messing with people's heads as much as you're running them over, quite frankly. Statue of Liberty play, I don't know if anyone remembers the game a few years ago where Boise State beat Oklahoma in a bowl game with some absolutely outstanding misdirection in the waning moments. This was the winning play. They, well, they faked a, uh, a quick screen, I think. We're faking go again, the run and shoot pass, and we're handing sort of behind the quarterback to the fullback who looks like he's sort of stepping up into pass protection and then takes off behind the lead block or two to the other side where there shouldn't really be anyone at that point. Ice, an isolation play, um, basically power running football off the same exact look of go. Only this time, we're going to double if we need to with the center and the spread guard. We're going to kick out with a spread tackle. We're going to lead block with H. And we're going to run the fullback right inside. And this, again, is the last thing they should be expecting having seen Z in long motion, Z in long motion, Z in long motion. <coughs> it's a run and shoot pass, it's a run and shoot pass. Oh my god, the fullback has the ball. This is not much of a football play by itself. Packaged into this series and called at the right time, when you notice that people are flagging a bit, that they're not being as crisp in their execution of their defensive duties, you exploit them ruthlessly. And it lends itself to play action because we can fake the ice pass, which is now a different layer of deception. Go is the pass play. Ice is the play action run off of go, which is a pass play. Ice pass is a play action pass off a play action run off a pass play, which is go. It's the third level of deception. If there's anyone left following you at this point, they're going to be, um, well, never mind. Um, it's not a pretty analogy. But you make these things as difficult as you need to, and you only ever call ice pass against the very best defenses. Against the ones that can keep up with go, the ones that can keep up with the ice play, and not get burned for 20 yards by it. But the ones who are competitive, thinking, okay, we're on this, we're on this, them you reserve ice pass for. The really, really sharp defenses who know what they're doing, remain gap sound, and are vigilant during the whole game, they'll still get burned. Because you packaged this all together the right way. Flow screen. Another great little screenplay. This time, um, the quarterback <coughs> is going to sprint out, semi-sprint, towards the what looks like go yet again. The fullback is going to set up to block to the spread side. And then it's going to drift back. You can't really see it because the motion line by Z covers it up. But the fullback is drifting back to the bunch side. And they're almost in the same spot that H would be on a bunch pass. And they get the short screen pass from the quarterback with, again, three people downfield blocking. You know, angle blocks, mechanical advantage over those defenders that are left there. And it's a brilliant bit of misdirection, completely back against the flow, which is why we call it flow screen. One more quick series here, bunch passing. This stuff will be down with even the best pass defenders. Because when you form the bunch, you ask them to either be physically superior in a way that allows them to cover your three receivers with three defenders, or they have to outnumber you. And if they outnumber you, they weaken themselves elsewhere and you exploit that. H goes in motion to form the bunch. Half slide protection. The fullback has two potential blitzers to block. Can't block them both. Has a call that he makes to the quarterback. If both of them are coming, fire, fire. Quarterback knows to throw off. This is a very effective pass route package. You have shallow crosses from both sides of the formation, so you're peeling off any tight man coverage, especially on X coming from the backside. So X will come through unscathed and be wide open even if they're in tight man coverage. Um, y is either running a corner or a post, depending on whether it's man or zone coverage. And H is out there in the strong side flat, and you've got deep, middle, shallow available to you. And if you really want to, you can call a throwback to Z all the way over on the other side of the formation, although that's not generally built into the reads for the quarterback. Why stick, one of the great plays in football? What we do with the stick play 
we form the bunch, H goes in motion and the snap takes off for the flat root. Y runs a stick root, gets about seven yards vertical, and then sticks it back in a bit of a hook action to the outside, away from the defenders who are back behind him. Um, if necessary, he can move laterally if he's got man coverage on him to get away and get open. We don't find that's necessary that often. What we're doing with Z is a little bit different here. We're actually expanding the formation after the snap by having Z slant out at a 45 degree angle, which defensive backs are not used to seeing from people who are lined up outside. So we're forcing depth and width on that defender at the same time, and they're not generally comfortable getting that from someone who's outside. So that's going to cause probably an overreaction and open up a nice hole for the stick root, and either Y or H will be wide open. Uh, y space is a great complement to that. Uh, y runs inside and basically sits down near the Mike linebacker, pins the defender down there, um, H is out in the flat again, and now um, the spacing root by Z starts out to the outside again as though we're running Y stick, which makes it deceptive, and then cuts vertical and curls. This is a mini curl. And now you get a distribution of three receivers that the quarterback can easily read inside, middle, outside. You can prioritize it outside, middle, inside. You can start on the back side with a quick slant, and you can read all the way across, bing, 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 bing. And that's easy, because you just scan the same direction the quarterback's eyes from one side to the other. The bunch crunch is um, one of the great names for football play. Um, again, you bring the Y end and the Z receiver end a little bit tighter for this so that Y can actually crack down on that defensive end. Um, when the linebacker over Y responds to that block down with a step down of his or her own, we're going to crack them too with Z. So we're going to fold in the outside defenders. We're going to get leverage on them and we're going to take them inside. We're going to release our people to the second level. We're going to lead block with H, who forms the bunch and then kicks out the force defender. And we're just going to quick toss the ball to the fullback and let him or, him or her rumble down the sideline until they get tired. <coughs> and then if we bring the tight end and wing back in this case, Y and Z in really tight, basically we've got wing T now. This is the red formation from wing T, more or less. This is an adjustment that we can make to the wild bunch. And now we're running the down play, which is a classic wing T block, uh, play, power play to the fullback. Only we're doing it with bunch motion. So they're, they're going to respect this when they see it as a potential pass play, because H goes not to the fly motion where he's short of the quarterback. He's more or less here when the ball snapped, we're going to run fly sweep. When he continues in motion, the defense is thinking, pass, 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 pass. They're thinking, the bunch is coming, the bunch is coming. No, it's not. So that's a different way of misdirecting defenders and exploiting their expectations. And now finally, just to show you, if this is the normal split for Y and Z in the normal wild bunch formation, we just call this right or left, we don't even have a name for it, we can tag formations in a number of different ways. The one we just saw with the down 